tomen asiento, por favor. Y quiero presentarles al moderador de esta primera mesa de conferencias. Él es Víctor Ramírez, de Buró Verde Arquitectura. Pido un aplauso para él, por favor. Hola, muy buen día. Eh, yo voy a tener el placer y el gusto de presentarles en primera instancia a la arquitecta Marta, Marta Schwartz, quien es arquitecta paisajista estadounidense, artista, educadora, autora y conferenciante. Es la socia fundadora de Marta Schwartz Partners, una firma de arquitectura de paisaje con sedes en Londres, Nueva York y Shanghái. El cuerpo de trabajo global de la firma se puede encontrar en los cinco continentes con proyectos que van desde instalaciones artísticas, parques públicos, paisajes corporativos, planes maestros urbanos, frentes de agua, jardines privados e instalaciones artísticas. Ella es originaria de Filadelfia, Pensilvania, y realizó su licenciatura en Bellas Artes en la Escuela de Arte de Arquitectura de la Universidad de Michigan en 1973. Después de dos años de estudio de posgrado en la Universidad de Michigan, Schwartz se transfirió a la Escuela de Graduados de Harvard. Durante una pasantía de verano en el grupo SWA, Schwartz pudo promover su interés en el arte de la tierra para expresar el potencial conceptual del paisaje. En los años formativos de su práctica, desafió la estética del paisaje convencional a recurrir a diversas influencias creativas como el pop art, el minimalismo, el land art y a escultores como Isamu Noguchi. Su carrera fue lanzada en 1979 por su primer proyecto, The Bagel Garden, una instalación dadaesque que cuestionó la ausencia de arte dentro de la profesión. El enfoque de diseño adoptado por Martha Schwartz y su empresa integra las adaptaciones del arte y el cambio climático a través de la integración de las tecnologías basadas en el paisaje y la ecología para abordar el cambio climático en el entorno urbano. El trabajo de la firma se ha caracterizado por proyectos impactantes y muy coloridos, como el Grand Canal Square en Dublín, Irlanda, eh, proyectos de paisajes urbanos como el Exchange Square en Manchester, Inglaterra, y más instalaciones conceptuales como la instalación de City and Nature en Xi'an, China. Menos conocidos son los proyectos naturalistas de la firma, como Winslow's Farms and Conservancy en Hamilton, Nueva Jersey, y Yorkville Park en Toronto. Gerald Tailings Landscape en Canadá, así como proyectos más transformadores basados en la comunidad de MSP en el Parque Monte La. Desde 2007, Schwartz ha sido profesor titular en práctica de arquitectura del paisaje y miembro fundador <coughs> del Grupo de Trabajo para Ciudades Sostenibles en la Escuela de Diseño de Harvard. Ella también fue residente de la Academia Americana de Roma en 1993 y miembro fundador del Climate Change Action Group en Landscape Architecture Foundation. Schwartz también es miembro del Comité Blue Ribbon sobre Cambio Climático de la Sociedad Americana de Arquitectos Paisajistas, la ASLA. Y bueno, pues sin más, le cedo la palabra y pido un aplauso para la arquitecta Marta Schwartz. Thank you, but I, I think that's all fake news. <laughs> Oh, hold on, I need to get my computer up. All right, what? 30 minutes? Uh, it's not going to be 30 minutes. Uh, really, uh, sorry, no. no, no it, okay, it, it's probably not going to be 30 minutes, but I'll go fast, okay? Um, I, I'm, I am very, very honored to be here. I absolutely love Mexico. I come to Mexico. I love Mexicans because they're so lovely and friendly and also, because um, I'm here to kind of tell you what I'm thinking about and why uh, us actually coming together and um, becoming uh, more connected uh, as our, our, our professional foundations. Um, we are citizens of landscape architecture, of the built environment, we're citizens of the Western Hemisphere, we're also citizens of the world. And so um, I've been kind of taking a, a bit of a global look at, um, let's say, the landscape, which actually doesn't really um, exist in its, uh, in, as a singularity. The landscape 
Even ecology is an outdated word. We are now thinking about the landscape, the atmosphere, the oceans, and ecology now is an old-fashioned world word. We're talking about earth systems now because we know everything is connected. Anyway, um, this is kind of a different Martha. Um, I, I don't think, I, I don't think any, I've never really written this in any of my um, kind of uh, backgrounds, but when I went to art school, I also majored in uh, science and biological sciences because it was interesting to me. I, I took them as kind of uh, elective courses. But I did graduate with enough courses to go to medical school. And uh, I even interviewed to go to medical school, but I just thought that it was such an unesthetic life and the people were so boring that I would just stick to the design and art group. But I do have a, a deep interest in science. So that's kind of where my head's been for the last two years. I know this is gonna be a very disjointed um, talk because I really don't know how to put all this stuff together, which is kind of one of my dilemmas. But I'm just gonna rip through here. I'm gonna start off by simply showing you images of things that we've done as a practice. I'm not going to talk about them. Um, I kind of, in one sense, have graduated. It's not that I don't love design. It's not that I don't love landscape. I love to make things. I know that that's fundamental about who I am. But right now, I have other things that are preoccupying my mind, and um, I can't get it out of my mind. So all of this, for me, in one sense, is, um, I guess, in the back of my mind. And I seem to have turned, made a big turn somewhere. And where, where I'm turning, I don't even know. Um, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going. But I, this work is the work over 30 years. I'm not doing bagel gardens anymore, but still making art and trying to do interesting work in the landscape, make, making landscapes that people enjoy, use, and therefore are sustainable. Um, this last one is an art installation in uh, Xi'an, which was a giant maze where um, you walk through all these tunnels and rooms, and as you're exiting, you realize that you've been watched all the time. So the title of this piece is Big Brother. Anyway, um, my story really kind of starts here. Uh, this is about a little bit over two years ago. Uh, my sister sent me a um, YouTube that she was kind of freaking out about and asked me to watch it. And it was uh, all about the uh, permafrost on the Eastern Siberian Arctic shelf that was melting. So um, this, this is actually, this was a giant collision in my head. So ever since then, I've never been the same. Um, I really haven't. Uh, this is the Eastern Siberian Shelf. This is an area that is uh, all along the Arctic uh, Ocean, which is heating up. Um, I found out about this Arctic Methane Emergency Group um, and uh, what they had on the website about a planetary catastrophe because of the warming of the Arctic and the melting of the ice and the permafrost, which actually kept the um, biological activities that are in the permafrost frozen. But now that it's melting, all these organisms are coming alive, and guess what? Producing lots and lots of methane. So um, methane is a gas that's about 28 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. So. They claimed that there was a need for geoengineering. I'm like, what does that mean? What's geoengineering? Uh, it sounds bad. And um, they're, they're, uh, what they need to do is cool the Arctic. It's like, well, good luck with that. And come back to pre-industrial kind of levels because otherwise this methane loop, there it is. That isn't a pretty picture there because that actually shows that once methane starts coming into play, there are these positive feedbacks, and because it's so strong, 
there is nothing we can do to actually keep it from continuing to happen. So there are these blowholes of methane. The methane is coming out of the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf. Um, uh, there's a lot of speculation about this, but um, if you, uh, you won't remember, but I don't know, a couple years ago there was this hole in California in a row where there was this methane leak, and they couldn't get it pulled together or cap it for, I don't know, about a month. And in that month, it produced as much greenhouse gases as all the car use in California since it existed. So um, this, this, that freaked me out a lot. So um, I'm going backwards here. All right, so uh, anyway, uh, I started seeing these kinds of images of the Arctic, um, of the, of the, yeah, of the Arctic itself. Now we know that um, you know, by 2050 there will not be any ice in the Arctic over the summertime. Anyway, all of this stuff, I kept going to these websites and reading this stuff, and um, I found this great cartoon in the New Yorker, of course, but it was like, geez, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? This is really, really not good. This sounds like we're not in a good place. And um, I think we all feel like this. Um, I think that it does seem like it's too big for us to cope with. What do we do? And yeah, how am I supposed to redo my landscaping and fight climate change? I don't know. Actually, a lot of us don't know the answer to this. So um, here's you know my dilemma. Um, also, you know what does my personal work have to do with the magnitude of our climate change issue? And you know I've been thinking about it and really thinking very deep, and I came up with the answer: nothing. It has no connection at all. It's not going to help anything. All right, so that means, well then, okay, now what do I do? Um, I've been doing this all my life, um, but uh, I just, I, there's gotta be something else because it's Siberian Arctic Shelf. And uh, I thought, oh, okay, well, uh, maybe I can do something. And I, honest to God, I did this. After I read about this crazy stuff on the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf, I found out that one of the leaders of this emergency group was a guy named Professor Wadhams, and he was at Cambridge University um, and, uh, in the same department as Stephen Hawking. And I called him up, and it was really, I mean, really dumb, but I was desperate, and I was like, hi, I, I'm Martha Schwartz. Uh, I'm a landscape architect, uh, and uh, I'd like to help you. I mean, um, I'd like to support what you're doing, and. Um, I don't know what I could do. I could help around the office. I could, you know, send envelopes out. I could help file. I mean, you know, is there something that I could do? And um, we got into a long conversation. He was so lovely. Actually, we are still in contact. He's, he's over at Scripps. But um, I, I'm not exactly sure what it is I'm doing, but he, he actually was so receptive. And we talked about, well, why haven't I heard this before? And we talked about how poor, how poorly the science community had been in terms of getting out this information and how inverted it is. And like, yeah, you guys suck at getting out your information. That's not good. Anyway, so this is kind of where I've been from that time to now. That is me. I read this stuff at night. It's probably why I'm taking, I, I'm on anxiety drugs. Seriously. Okay, so let's go back to where we were in 2007 in the good old days. Um, the IPCC said that uh, beyond two degrees uh, centigrade, uh, studies show that we lock the climate into a state of continuing state of feedback loops, kind of like the methane thing, and we can't bring the climate back to a stabilized state. We're now at 1.6, so we don't have a lot to get to two. And by the way, we'll be at two by 2050. The other IPC tipping point was 400 parts per million, beyond which we shouldn't go. We're beyond 400 points per million. We've already passed that tipping point as well. So that was a nice thought. But here's where we are now. 
The world is now warmer than it has been at any point in the last two millennia, and if the current trends continue by the end of the century, it will likely to be hotter than at any point in the last two million years. And according to the IPCC projections, we're on track to hit two um, degrees centigrade around 2050 as we continue as business as usual. Here it shows that uh, the tipping point was set at 350 parts per million, and it shows a, c a scenario of concentrations in carbon dioxide in parts per million. But we're at 400, we're beyond 400, and we're, going, we're scheduled to be at 1,000 by the end of 2100 in a business as usual scenario, which will produce desertification, food disruption, water shortages, here in Mexico, by the way, sea level rise, six meters, not six feet, more violent and unpredictable weather, ocean acidification, disruption of sea currents, the melting of permafrost, releasing of methane, northern migrations of pests and pathogens, and as you'll see, mass migrations of humid clim climate refugees and mass extinctions. By the way, we are in the sixth great extinction. I don't know whether you've heard about that. There's a great book on it, but by mid-century, most of the large mammals, meaning large, bigger than this size, will be extinct, gone. So that's where we, that's where we are. So climate is a very difficult phenomenon to measure, and there are a lot of opinions about future predictions. And this graph shows a more dire prediction that tracks possible highs, and, and it shows that it is possible that while we may not reach two degrees by 2050, by 2100, we could be at a catastrophic six degrees. Uh, four degrees beyond our ability to reverse the feedback loops. And by the way, we will not be able to live in a four degree world. We, we will not be able to survive it. Uh, we will barely be able to survive between a two and three degree world. And that's what we're heading to. But we won't have to worry about huge sea level rises of six meters if that does happen because the Greenland and Antarctic shelf um, will actually create an immediate huge metric rise in sea level. Anyway, um, this shows our ability to bring down emissions hasn't worked. And in the last 15 years after the Kyoto Climate Change Conference, emissions are up 50%. So this is just kind of how we're rolling right now. And uh, this one really freaked me out because this is an article that just was on the news. This stuff is like now happening. You can see it, it's there. As per this article in the past July, scientists from around the world, 17 countries, determined that global warming may be twice what the climate models predict. Sea levels may rise six meters, not six feet, or even more if the world meets the two degree target, which is not going to happen according to the consensus of the scientific community. So this is really where we are. Uh, also, I mean, um, this guy, the scientist Tim Letton, said that there are all other kind of uh, tipping points which are happening now. Uh, boreal forest dieback, Amazon rainforest is actually going to become a desert, the loss of Arctic and Antarctic sea ice, uh, the Greenland ice shelf, in, uh, disruption to the Indian West African monsoon, as well as the slowing of the Gulf Stream, which is why when was it, the hurricane hit North Carolina, it stayed there. That's what's going to happen. It's not moving. The hurricanes are not moving because the Gulf Stream has slowed down. They're just going to sit there and grind away at the cities. All right. So once again, what do we do? We're just landscape architects, you know? Oh, that's what I feel like, actually. Okay, so one thing we can do is we can also read. We, we, we're all well-trained people. Read. Um, there is no one place to go to for this information. There's no one university, one, no one person. I didn't go to school for this. I just, I've just been reading books and reading stuff online. This is a do-it-yourself proposition. And the point is, is that we need leadership badly. And IFLA is a very, very important place if we're going to do anything as a group. 
and as a hemisphere and as a world. And this is kind of why I'm here. Uh, this is a great book, everybody should get it. It's called Drawdown, it's by Paul Hawken, which lists the top 100 solutions that can be implemented to draw down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which is called mitigation. And that's what needs to happen in order to draw down the temperature. Um, it's really fantastic because he gives you these solutions, he measures the amount of um, carbon dioxide in gigatons, and then the, the financial benefits of the effectiveness, which we all need in order for us to actually go to policymakers. We have to come up with metrics. We need hard evidence of what we're doing. Otherwise, guess what? We're just there watering plants like that lady was. We have to get tougher and harder in terms of what we're doing and being able to do those metrics. So these are the 80 lists, the solutions that are in practice that can be scaled up now. The yellow are all land-based solutions. These are things that you should all know about and be aware of. And the 10 are immediately implementable solutions that our profession can use. I won't have time to discuss them. Go get the book, take a look. My students all have to read it. So as a profession, we have made a lot of progress regarding learning about resilience and dealing with water management. We've bumped up to really doing wonderful work, bigger scale, thinking about resilience and really becoming a much more important part of urban planning in terms of resiliency. And um, I just wish I could get my hands on this kind of project. Uh, however, um, I'll tell you something. Um, we are in a resiliency rut. It's all about resiliency, right? Well, I'm afraid that won't get us out of the situation that I've just described. We can be resiliency till the cows come home. But it's not going to change the scientific facts of global warming. So, you know, what can I say? You either get on the bus or off the bus, like the Grateful Dead. We need to figure out how to go up a scale in terms of our ability to act. Uh, here is a very good diagram, which shows you very clearly why I'm saying what I'm saying. Um, the terms mitigation and adaptation refer to two different paths for dealing with climate change. And everybody has to know this terminology. You have to know the language of climate change. In contrast, adaptation makes changes to prepare for the negative effects of climate change. Like we know this is happening, we need to change things fast because we know it's happening, and we adapt to what's happening. But guess what? It's, good. it's not on a straight trajectory. It's gonna happen more and it's gonna happen worse. So that means you're in a continuous cycle of adaptation. So you're gonna end up spending all your money adapting, which is good, you can hold it off for a certain amount of time, but it's not the solution. Um, by adapting to cope with the effects of climate change, communities, enterprises, and institutions can build up their climate change resiliency. Resiliency is what you do in order to make the adaptation work. That's where we are. Now, mitigation deals with the causes of climate change and works to reduce man-made effects on the climate system. This is where we have to go if we actually want to make change. Uh, that's what science says. If you believe in scientists, this is what is necessary. And we have to figure out how we're gonna do that. Otherwise, as a profession, in one sense, we will be fiddling while Rome burns. And not just Rome, there's Madrid, Athens, the Sahel, Southwest United States, which provides 25% of our vegetables, Mexico City, and the areas in the Middle East, in the northern part of South America, and uh, Australia also, El Gano, deserts. And unfortunately, so go their cultural landscapes as well. So anyway, I'm ju just saying. So, okay, that's not good. I have kids, I do have children. Um, they're the focus of my life. Um, well, we need to kind of move on this issue because 
I can't stand thinking about the world that I've left them. Um, so I'm thinking, what about the institutions? Maybe I should think about what's happening with the organizations. Am I off one here? Oh, sorry. No, I this is fine. Let's 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 go to the other one. You you have no idea what's happening backstage here. Nothing is is working. Okay. So what are the organizations doing? So this is the next chapter of kind of what I wanted to talk about. Um, let's go to uh, this one, the ASL. Okay, this one is oh, here. Let's see. Do I not have this? Yeah. Okay. Just yeah. That's good. Okay. All right. So um, in a very few weeks. Uh, uh, at the ASLA convention uh, in uh, Philadelphia, uh, I and some other panel members are going to come together and talk about what the various organizations in the U.S. are doing so we can have a better idea of what, what are we doing? What is the LAF doing? What is the ASLA doing? What is the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects doing? What is the Canadian IFLA sector doing? So the, the reason for this is just to try to coordinate and organize the organizations. And the reason for this is so that we can be made more powerful and more effective in terms of advocacy. Because if we're going to advocate, if we're actually going to be able to get up to the point where we can go to Capitol Hill, talk to our planners, we have to be, and talk to the rest of the world and each other, we have to be coordinated. We have to know what we're doing. So this is really a speech to IFLA, which is about really continuing to do what you're doing in terms of coordinating um, all of us. And I think that because you are a global community, it's up to IFLA to really understand what is happening in climate change and making sure that we are doing all we can do to make change for the positive. Um, my partners here are wonder women. I mean, unbelievable women. There's Colleen Mercer Clark, who is the past president of the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects, the 216 recipient of the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects President's Award. Uh, she chairs the, uh, their Committee on Climate Adaptation, and she's also, uh, she also chairs the committee at the, the, the IFLA Working Group on Climate Change. She's a genius. She has actually, she and her son wrote a, pr a primer about climate change that everybody should access. If you look it up, you will learn about it from Colleen. And by the way, she starts off with mitigation. So it's like, thank you, Colleen. That's really awesome. Uh, Vaughn Renner, who is uh, the immediate past president of, American, of the ASLA, uh, she is the chair for the Interdisciplinary Blue Ribbon Panel on Climate Change. She also is a mighty force, and uh, these are all super intelligent, super knowledgeable um, landscape architects who are actually leading um, the charge. Uh, Pamela Conrad is this young woman, actually, who uh, has crazily put us all together to talk. Um, and she actually has won the LAF uh, uh, grant, and I don't know, Barb, if you saw this, but she's figured it out. How to actually, I'll, I'll, I got it this morning, said, so, well, Pamela, why didn't you send it to me beforehand? But she is working on a cal carbon calculator. Do you know that our profession does not have a carbon calculator? What's that? How, are, are we asleep or what? But we do now, thanks to the LAF. Thank you, Barb for doing that, but soon we will have a real tool. And she was, she told me about what percentage, 30% we can actually mitigate and actually come, I mean, as we're designing. Wow, so okay, what are the benefits? Why are we trying to do? We would like together, and this includes IFLA, because this is really to IFLA here. We need to build and employ an impactful lobbying effort. We need to lobby. We need to enhance and expand knowledge across uh, our, our fields. Um, we need to enhance collaboration across other professional organizations. We have to maximize our strength in numbers and elevate our contributions as a profession. And I'll talk about this, but actually we have to 
get from resilience up to mitigation, we have to bump up in scale in terms of our actions, our thoughts, our knowledge base. Anyway, so we will be talking about that um, in, uh, in uh, soon. I, I don't have my act together for that either. Okay, so. Uh, you can just go back. Uh, this one here, CSLA. Quick. Yeah, thanks. It's nice. It's human, right? <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I'm just very quickly going to go through. What was that? Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm going to go through really quickly kind of my. Oh, I've really been looking at the different uh, groups. And I would say that. The ASLA is really bound to its constituency, and it serves its constituency, the people who, who pay their dues. And it's very focused on practice and the profession. And uh, it has been involved with uh, uh, mostly resiliency. It, it focuses resiliency and what we can do at that scale of intervention. Um, they have put together a blue ribbon panel on climate change, I have to say, only after the LAF took action. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, what is the LAF doing about climate change? Um, uh, you, you were probably aware, or may not, but uh, 216, this is after I called up Professor Wadhams, uh, the LAF had a summit in Philadelphia about the future of landscape architects and asked people to give these declarations. By this time, I mean, that rock had hit my head. And I was freaking out on stage, like I am today, and saying, hey, you know, the, this is, we all have to pay attention to climate change. But there was no organization in the United States who had taken this on as a subject matter. And uh, thank you, Barbara, Deutsch, thank you. Because, yeah, you actually enabled it. She's sitting there, yeah. So she said, okay, we'll do it. And we are doing it. We have now a, a, a climate change task force, and we are moving forward. There are a lot of things that are going on. There's going to be a website. Uh, uh, also, Barbara is deploying us to go out and speak to people and speak to policymakers and to show up on Capitol Hill. I mean, she is a slave driver, but. Um, there are a lot of things that are coming out of this, but actually I have to say the best thing that came out of it is that after we had gotten started, a year later, the uh, ASLA thought, well, maybe they should start something too. So they did, and which is great, and they are also doing a good job. Now the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects, I have to say, I'm not surprised, but they are two years ahead of us. Um, they have been working on their climate change task force since 2014, they have Colleen uh, Mercer Clark working on it, who is a, uh, a master at this, and they have been working on uh, this. As I said, this a uh, primer. You should take pictures of this. You should open it up. This is where you really learn so much about climate change. Um, and then uh, it, uh, they also have been working with the IFLA Global Accord, which is an amazing thing. So um, IFLA. Uh, believes that we have to act now to reduce our contributions to greenhouse gases, and to sequester or you know mitigate carbon dioxide. So this is already on the to-do list for IFLA. But the question is, is this information really getting to you, to people, to students, to young people, to teachers? Because this isn't just any to-do list. This is actually going to affect our futures. We'll still be alive when this happens. So it's not somebody else's future. Anyway, um, I think that we have to, I mean, we have to really think more broadly about um, what we are. Now, this working group on climate change uh, really has these very, you know, these three goals, be reliant, transformative, sustainable. The fact that we now have this kind of, um, Global accord is fantastic. We need global accord. We need global action. We need global movement. We have to figure out how we come together to make that happen. I put this little graph together just to show you kind of my own take. I could be completely wrong in terms of um, where the various uh, uh, 
of organizations lie in terms of their interests and their focus. Um, the ASLA, their scale of invent intervention is really kind of focused on resiliency, which is you can be resilient in your backyard. You really don't need other people to be resilient, or you can be resilient kind of in your own community, down your street, but you also need other people to fund resiliency within a city. Um, so that's why they have, it goes from one person to a group of people. Um, and this is what they're training landscape architects to be able to do. Um, the middle part, adaptation, is a bigger intervention. It takes more money. It actually needs more, more um, input. It needs more top-down input. It's not something you can do by yourself. And the last group, mitigation, really is a top-down kind of effort. We really need to think about how we're going to cool down the Arctic. Okay, that's what we need to do. We need to cool down the Arctic. That's what we need to do. So we need to figure out how we're going to do that. And I'm going to show you how we can do that, by the way. So in studying landscape and its ability, the landscape also mitigates climate change. I've learned that in order to have a positive effect in emissions, scale matters. It also matters in harnessing political will and changing policy, and that's why IFLA must continue to keep organizing and pulling our local professional bodies together so we can create a scale to deal with scalar issues such as climate change. And without each other, we cannot make much of a difference, but I believe that together we can make a difference. So, okay, here I am. I've been teaching design forever, and maybe I'll teach a design studio on climate change, but I don't know much about it, but the students won't know that. <laughs> so I'm just gonna quickly go through this, um, this studio I did at Harvard two years ago, which was, you know, it was really all about how to create, uh, how to insert ecology, working ecology back into cities, given new technologies that would be around by 2050. This was based on a study done by Harvard Forest, who work with Harvard Forest, which is the longest studied forest in North America. Um, and uh, they were very useful in uh, creating these. They are now planning for climate change, by the way, so Massachusetts can be sustainable. Because they know that climate refugees are coming this, our way. We know that the South is going to desertify. They know that we're going to have to replenish our aquifer, so they, we know the amount of um, planning and construction we can do without disabling our aquifer, not having any water. They know we need a certain amount of land so that we can actually plant our crops and have food. This, these are the things that we're thinking about, because they're going to happen. I'm actually running a studio on this also this semester. So the idea here is to insert forests into the city because we, what we've put asunder, actually we've wiped out all ecological functioning, now we have to put it back because technology cannot recreate ecology. We all love technology, it's not going to save us. Actually it will, I take it back, but we have to then make sure that we put our ecology back working. So we would have clean air, so we would sequester greenhouse gases, diminish energy usage, and assist with water management. This is what forests can do. We create environments that support ecology by doing connected greenways. We're able to deal with storm water management. This is something that you guys are really going to have to figure out because what happens in, our, in these rain events now is that they are going to come they're going to deliver too much water, and then in between these events, there won't be enough water. So if all the water goes into the sewer, uh, that's a huge loss. You're not going to be able to irrigate your plants, your trees. It's going to become a desert. Um, I would recommend that you look at Rob Adams, who is the, the head planner of Melbourne, Australia. He's figured out how to design the streets, so the streets um, capture the water underground so that you can irrigate the trees during the summer so that uh, less energy is used. So this is exactly the model we're looking at. So the problem is where do we find this area in a dense city like Boston? 
Now, um, these are the assumptions, and this is, again, a, a speculative studio set in the year 2050. So our assumptions are that there is going to be no more construction beyond the ring road, the black line, no more construction because we need the land for agriculture and for the for to recharge our aquifer. Uh, the yellow is an area where no owned vehicles can go in because the, that area is going to have public transportation within it. And you'll see other assumptions. This, by the way, is Boston in 2050. Have, have any of you seen this image? Boston isn't there. MIT isn't there. Harvard, that, that's MIT, right there. MIT, it's, El, it's gone. Um, the airport's gone, the tunnels are gone. This is, by the way, storm surge. It's two feet of sea level rise, maybe not that much, but storm surges, and that's Boston. Now, I don't think they're actually, I, they're still out. I don't know what they're thinking about. It. So our assumption class is that we're gonna save Boston, but it really depends. Cities, some cities will save themselves, some won't. Uh, we have assumed we can plant lots of trees in a very small space. This guy in India is a, um, an entrepreneur, and he's figured out how to plant 300 trees in the area of six parked cars. So uh, yes, you can do that. And the thing is, is that trees that are growing take down more carbon dioxide than when they're fully grown. So it's kind of a managed planting, but just stuff it with trees. Then various types of water management where we're both actually taking water and detaining it so that it sinks into the ground and also water that we're retaining it for irrigation. We're also stripping off all the impermeable, sorry, impermeable surfaces because that creates some runoff and the need for sewers. If you have permeable surfaces, all the water can go back into the ground and charge your aquifer. And then uh, this one is really important and that is the increase of albedo. We were just painting whatever roofs were black, white, in terms of creating, you know, and albedo is all about uh, reflecting light and heat back up into the atmosphere. We chose trees that were going to work, and, and that means that what will work in South Carolina will now work in Boston. Uh, the use of automated vehicles, which we consider to be a fact of uh, 2050, we studied how much area automated vehicles will take, which is extremely is an, an extreme find for cities, since automated vehicles um, take far less room than cars. And you can see this diagram here, where on the top, um, this is a highway. You can see it's about 92 feet of space you need. Here with automated vehicles, it's 20. So it's it's a little less than 25% of that space that you need. It's not as true in cities, but I can say that you can probably take out 30% of all your paved surfaces and with the use of automated vehicles. And the good thing is that this is in the public realm, which means it can be controlled, it can be controlled and um, manipulated by the city. You don't have to go to individual homeowners to get permission. It's something that we can do as citizens. It's something that cities can do because it's in the public realm. This is a program that the United States uh, Forest Service has uh, uh, de uh, actually developed. It's called iTree. Could I see the hands if anybody knows about this? All right, okay, so good. We have some people there who know, know this. This is an amazing tool because it actually studies every kind of tree in terms of everything you can think of. What kind of greenhouse gases they take down, how much they take down, what it, money it saves, how much shade they make, how much money it saves in terms of the need for um, energy, how many pollutants it takes down, how much water uptake, and everything. So each tree can be calculated. All right, so this is our study area. It's about 104 um, square miles. No, I'm not gonna finish, I'm telling you. I'm gonna just stand here, you're gonna have to drag me off, because I wanna show you this. So areas of each student, um, each student was divided up. Um, this one is just one student's work, and he had a very dense area in Boston. And the important thing here are the sections, which shows the area that 
can actually take automated vehicles and the other areas that have been stripped from the asphalt and replanted with all the water devices underneath. So these are what the students measure. Now this, so okay, so no, no, go back one. I'm just staying here so you can kind of drag me off. So um, this one student, you can see that the new trees you put in may save four million dollars in terms of energy savings. The white roofs, the albedo, saved 22 million. So altogether, he saved 26 million dollars a year in energy savings. Now let's go to the next one. Now each student, we had each student had a section, and adding all the sections together, we were able in four counties, so townships, sorry, we were able to save 206 million nine hundred thousand dollars in energy savings just by planting these trees. And not one drop of water went into the sewer. So I know people are talking about, oh, what about automated vehicles? We can do really cool stuff, put you know, seats out in, into, the, into the road, or we can build more buildings. But what about reinserting ecology? Uh, anyway, so that's something that I think is very important. Now, now uh, population, let's just get to kind of where we are. Um, this is pretty complicated. What it's really saying is that by the 21st century, 8 billion more people are going to be consuming as much as energy as 2 billion did in the 20th century, which means that there's a lot more energy use that's going to be made. So, wait, let's, why? No, 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 let's, I'm sorry. Can you see this? Yeah. I'm up here. There you go, thanks. So, why mitigation? Why is mitigation so important? And this is really the heart of what I wanted to get at. So let's go through population. I talked about that. Let's go to the next one. So the scientists now just say that the IPCC target simply cannot be met. And uh, the reality is one or another form of geoengineering and that needs to be done as soon as possible. This comes from the scientific community. Uh, this, this man, Arnest Grubler, Grubler, he studies energy transitions. And he concluded that they've been very, very slow over time. And it takes about 100 years for cultures to actually transfer from one form of energy to another. Uh, we don't have 100 years. We don't have 50 years. Uh, so the idea that we're going to transfer to renewables in any time soon is not going to happen. Uh, the environmental policy, can you see this? The problem is most of the people creating the problem are not faced with the problem. And even if we magically decide to go globally investing in non-fossil fuel sources of energy, uh, it's still going to displace so many people and uh, perhaps even um, you know, create these, and it will create these giant uh, uh, kind of ramifications such as climate refugees. So, but these countries actually will suffer less, which is um, a crime. So uh, the impacts also of what we've done now today, we're not gonna be able to roll it back, just so everybody understands. If everything were to stop today, let's say a miracle happened, we're all on renewables, no more you know, uh, CO2 being put up, the sea level rise is an irreversible process that would take millennia to stabilize, even if greenhouse gases are controlled. Um, the oceans would catch up with the atmosphere, and the Earth's temperature would rise another 1.1 degrees. So at 1.6, we're, all, we're already over 2 degrees centigrade, if we were to stop now. The ice would continue to melt. Uh, the glaciers will melt. The Arctic will continue to melt. The permafrost will continue to be um, actually uh, put into the atmosphere. And if we stop our missions today, we will never get back to where we are today. After a long period of leveling out, that's where we're going to, we're going to stay. We will never have an Earth like we have today. Just saying. So, okay, six degrees. This is another book you should read. This 
I mean, it's excruciating and gut wrenching, but it goes up one sorry one degree at a time. In a three degree world, um, there uh, cities will be drowned, and the UN is warning that we are on the course of three degrees of global warming, and this will ultimately redraw the map of the world. The last projections were pointing to an increase of three point two degrees by uh, twenty one hundred. So these are all the cities that will be gone by 2050. Uh, currently, the forecasts vary from 25 million to 1 billion environmental migrants by 2050, moving either within their countries or across borders on a permanent or temporary basis. Um, yeah, uh, 200 million is actually the uh, prognosis prognostication from the Institute of Environment and Human Security of the United Nations University. Um, the UN Organization for Migration for forecasts 200 million environmental mi migrants also by 2050. The United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification estimates 135 million may be displaced uh, by 2045. And up to 12 million hectares of productive land become barren every year due to desertification and drought alone, which is a lost opportunity to produce 20 million tons of grain. Uh, we are going to have food uh, shortages. That is going to really cause a lot of the um, migrations. The reality is one or another form of geoengineering needs to be treated as a real possibility, and the challenge is made even bigger by the fact that current climate change discussions are small, and the various organizations that are paying attention are largely ignored by those with real power in the government. So the scientific community's solidarity, solidarity on this justifies serious action, such as our solidarity. So um, this is a great book. Again, I suggest you read it. And everything I say comes from this book. It's called The Planet We Made, How Geoengineering Could Change the World by Oliver Morton. Um, it's inevitable that it's going to happen. We're going to need it. You should know the language of it. You should know the ideas behind it so that um, perhaps you yourself can see the logic of it. I found this. It's hilarious because uh, this one scientist in the UK got nailed for supporting geoengineering. Everybody hates geoengineering. When you hear this, when I hear it, when I talk to my sons, uh, I mean, they hate geoengineering because it's a conspiracy or because it's dangerous or because it hasn't been tested. And they're right about that. It has not been tested. However, the science community has been working on these things for years. Like, they've known about climate change for 60 years and we're just finding out about it now because they haven't really been able to get out their message. They are really working on this like crazy. So, I mean, here are just numbers of different kinds of ideas, but I'm going to actually show you some of them now. But, um, let's see, uh, yeah, okay. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, anyway, so. At a conference in Calgary um, uh, in 2012, uh, Robert Sokolow, who's a physicist from Princeton, asked two questions to his audience of climate change scientists to help his audience get the most out of their day by giving them a clear understanding of where they were. And others stood when it came to action on climate change. He wanted to see what people were thinking. So he asked these two questions. and. Um, where are the questions here? Okay, I'm going to ask you guys this. Um, how many people uh, uh, here believe that believe that the risks of climate change merit serious action aimed at lessening them? Who believes that we need serious action to lessen climate change? Okay, well, it might be half and half. Who believes that we don't need serious change? Where are your hands? <laughs> really, come on, you're wimps. Can I see that again? I'd really like to know. I mean, how many of you think that there are serious risks to climate change in this room? Okay, that's better. Jeez. All right. All right, another question. Will moving from a fossil, and you may not really understand the economics of this, so you can bail out on this one, but 
Will moving from a fossil fuel economy to one that hardly uses fossil fuels be difficult? How much think it will be difficult to do? All right, well, a lot of you, maybe some, okay, so, but you who answered yes and yes, you are actually in agreement with the scientists in that room in Calgary. <laughs> so, okay, let's just go to this next one. Okay, so geoengineering here. So geoengineering actually is intended to draw down carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere or deliberately bring down heating up to the globe, uh, heating up the globe to buy us time. In other words, it's not a permanent solution, but it could actually stop the heating up so we could get our act together on Earth and should transfer to renewables. So that's the idea. Now, these ideas uh, started coming up pretty early on, like in 1990 when Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines uh, erupted and killed hundreds of people. And in the stratosphere, ash, it spread around the world uh, and put in about 20 tons of sulfur dioxide and created a very, very fine veil of aerosol mist that um, lasts a couple of years. Now, um, Jim Hansen is one of these climate change heroes. He showed that the volcanoes had a cooling effect. So everything cooled because of the volcano. And people wondered whether Pinatubo could actually be more of an experiment and a prototype. Now, we all know Venus. We know, all know it's very bright, very beautiful. Uh, the upper atmosphere of Venus is highly re reflective because it has sulfuric acid particles. Its climate is made of sulfur. And it increases the planet's albedo, so it reflects back more light. And the thinking was that there was a way to get sulfur into the Earth's upper atmosphere, similar shininess, shininess might result. So there are three types of geoengineering. There is the increase the amount of carbon dioxide that plants absorb. This is where we come in. There are things we can do, but at a big scale. We can increase the amount of carbon dioxide that the oceans absorb, which is patently a bad idea. And we can create machines that pull carbon dioxide out of the air, which is actually what we're doing right now. We actually have machines that can do that. Now, the author says, quote, there is much to criticize in such thinking. It can be horribly simplistic. It can feed on and give rise to ideas that are neither plausible nor palatable. It can be used to justify inaction. Oh, well, I, can't, I don't agree with that. I'm not going to do anything. But it can also open up doors which are both practical and utopian. There may be ways in which climate geoengineering could really reduce harm. Morton thinks that imagining geoengineered worlds that might be good to live in in which people could be safer and happier than they would be otherwise is worth doing. And in the end, this will be a project that will have to be as political as it is scientific or technological. So this is where we also come in, political. We can be political and we can be knowledgeable about what we're talking about. So uh, David King, yeah, OK. He also is a crazy hero. He's at Harvard. I actually know this guy. He's an Earth Systems uh, scientist. And he concluded that in a pinch, you could deliver a million tons of aerosols with the density about as much of, as water into some parts of the stratosphere with airplanes that we have today, and thereby cool the Earth. Uh, there are clear obstacles to the problem, such as type of delivery and costs. And there is something called termination shock, which is if you start doing this, that if you stop, it gets worse. OK, so there are problems that still need to be solved. But the consensus of the scientific community is the sunlight scattering schemes need to be studied compared to the reduction of uh, carbon dioxide emissions. They are very, very cheap and can be accomplished. So the question is, is how much does this cost versus actually losing our Earth? These are questions. So I mean, this is kind of a wonderful image of what these veils might look like. 
So the next one is air cloud, uh, so it's cloud seeding and sunshine energy. And so cloud seeding actually started as early as 1946 in the General Electric Research Lab in Schenectady, New York. And the scientists discovered that they would be working on clouds. It would be difficult because no two clouds are alike. Um, dozens of seed, uh, cloud seeding programs have continued this day. Actually, 42 countries are, are using it now. This one I absolutely love. Um, this is, uh, these are cloud ships. This idea came from John Latham from the University of Manchester, and he was the first person to think about deliberately cooling the earth with clouds, by actually making clouds. So he, what he's doing is has, he's putting cloud condensation nuclei, in other words, clouds form because of little particles of dust that are in the atmosphere. So his idea was to spray salt water, which contains salt, up into the atmosphere, around which these molecules of water form and then create these clouds. And then it would, and the clouds actually then reflect light. So it's a way of brightening the, the earth. So um, yeah, I like this cloud boat a lot. Uh, here's David Keith again with direct air capture. Uh, he has been <laughs> working with building these machines to just extract it directly out of the atmosphere. And the last time I gave this, um, this lecture, um, it was too expensive yet. However, now he's in business. He has a business doing this uh, called um, carbon engineering. Uh, and it's a process that um, takes out the carbon dioxide, purifies it, um, and he, he com it compresses the carbon dioxide, and then he makes it into um, clean burning liquid fuels. So he's doing this now. Uh, I'd like to invest in what he's doing. Um, yeah, because uh, now it seems like it's operational. This one is wonderful. I found this in the New York Times. I mean, this stuff is coming up everywhere. So this is about rocks, again, landscape. But this white, the, this is called um, kind of uh, carbon mineralization, where veins of white carbonate materials run through slabs of dark rock called peridotite. Anyway, the carbonate surrounds pebbles and the cobbles, and scientists say that this natural process called carbon mineralization could be harnessed, accelerated, and applied inexpensively on a huge scale. Now, what they're saying is uh, these rocks are found in Oman, and Northern California, and some other places, but there's a lot of it. They would grind it up, with, um, uh, increase the surface area, and spread it on beaches and land, and it would actually draw down a lot of carbon dioxide. Air carbon capture and sequestration actually is taking away uh, carbon dioxide at its source, meaning coal and coal-fired industries and burning of coal. Um, it could ha have an amazing, actually, effect, but I know in the United States, the coal lobbyists have actually lobbied against it. We don't have it. So this is where we come into real issues, where the politicians have another agenda. I myself have another agenda from the politicians, so we can talk about that. This, no, this other one is about biomass, and it's about um, burning plants. So the idea here is that you actually burn plants. It's called the BEX. Uh, it's biomass energy with carbon capture, and the idea is to use the, uh, the plants to actually create energy and then to store that energy back into the ground. The only way you sequester is by putting things back into the earth. Um, this one here, I just saw, uh, a friend of mine sent it to me. This is a um, geothermal power plant that is actually um, run by uh, the, the the heat inside of the land in Iceland. Um, the plant captures more carbon dioxide than it produces, meaning it actually produces negative emissions. Um, the walls of fans suck in the air, it filters out the carbon dioxide and injects the carbon dioxide into water, which is then pumped into the ground. And the rocks actually absorb the carbon dioxide, the, rock, the rocks of Reykjavik, which are specific to Reykjavik. It's too expensive right now, but it actually takes down a huge amount of carbon dioxide. Okay, here are some plants. This is just some fun facts, but bioengineered plants. 
Uh, Andy Richwell of Bristol University has genetically engineered crops so that they have more reflective leaves. And the dispersal of light from the bottom up, um, the leaves above them get more sun and increases the albedo. Um, so I wanted to talk about forests because this is another thing that we can do, if we can do and should do. Uh, and this is also from um, Drawdown. When you add up the impact of carbon sequestration and storage, forest protection, and tropical and temperate forest restoration, this is what we can do, and this is what the class is doing. Together are the most powerful solutions available to address global warming. So I didn't want you to leave thinking you can't do anything. You can. The landscape is extremely effective in bringing down carbon dioxide. So we have to really gather around these vaster landscapes and protect them because otherwise we won't have a cultural landscape. I'm telling you, this is very important. So in Paul Hawkins' list, four of the top five 15 solutions are these forests, and one is peatland. I just have to have another fun fact, is that aside from the oceans, the peatlands, which are only 3% of the Earth's coverage, draw down the most carbon dioxide. But that's permafrost. And peat is covered by water, but as soon as they're exposed to air, it goes like a chimney. It goes right back up in the atmosphere. So the value of these particular forests ecosystems are critical to the future health of our planet. And what we do, what you guys do in the future, I don't know what you're going to do, but it's clear that they need to be saved at all costs. And due to their size and cross-political boundary locations, there is very little we can do as individuals. But there are individuals out there working to do this. But together, we can have a voice in their protection, and we should be doing this. We need to advocate and support other voices to make them stronger. And this is a job for all of us as individuals, and it's a job for IFLA. So the scientific community is consistent with their opinion that geoengineering is inevitable, as we, as a species, will survive this century and into the next. And it doesn't mean that we know that it's going to work. That's a problem. And this is something that I am hoping that will one day happen, where scientists will re receive governmental funding, or perhaps not governmental funding, because I actually don't have confidence in our governments to do it. My own idea is that we figure out how to go get funding from individuals, all those rich dudes out there who are just tinkering with stuff, and sending people up in hotels to the moon, get the private sector to fund a Manhattan Project, an international group of funders to support the research of global engineering, because it's going to have to be international anyway. Because to try to get you know beyond Donald Trump or whoever comes next, it's almost like forget about it. We have to actually think smarter. So. Um, now, my next book, which is also very joyful, called Climate Wars by Gwen Dwyer, she says that a number of great powers, this is the other thing that, like, oh no, climate change scenarios are already playing a large and increasing role in the military planning process. As each country pays its professional military establishment to identify and counter imminent threats to its security. She says, but the implications of their scenarios are alarming. She's a Brit, so she understates stuff. I'm totally freaked out about that idea because I kind of know what the United States spends on their military. I know where my taxes go. They're not going to infrastructure or roads or to healthcare or to transport or anything. We have a huge military, and you know what? This is what those guys are spending their money on. I mean, because when people start shifting demographics, they're doing it because they are hungry and they're thirsty. And that's not negotiable. It's either find some food or water or die. So this is kind of where those guys are going.
we don't know it because, hey, we're landscape architects, you know, but this is what's happening. So once that stops, once there are any wars that could happen, even nuclear wars, then any possible way of negotiation between countries becomes impossible. So that's why another reason why there is urgency here. It's why I'm standing up here and not going anywhere. I'm, 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 I'll be off soon. Anyway, I'm just giving you backup that this is not me being totally crazy. I mean, I'm reading this stuff. I'm delivering it to you. This is from Sunday Times, you know, like, oh, what's happening uh, today? Let's get some coffee here. So it says, it's clear that we're going to have to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, said Roger Ains, who leads the development of carbon management technology at Lawrence Livermore Labs in California. I mean, these guys are geniuses. And we're going to have to do it in a gigaton scale. In other words, this issue of scale comes up over and over and over again which is why our organizations have to come together so we can operate in scale. Uh, IPCC report, many adaptation mitigation options can help address climate change, but no single option is sufficient into itself. Effective implementation, implementation depends on policies and cooperation at all scales and can be enhanced through integrated responses that link adaptation and mitigation with other social objectives. I just want to say, I am not saying, don't do your job in resiliency. Don't do your job in adaptation. Do your job. You have to do it. But you must now be thinking at another scale on how you can act. You have to think about the reality of where we're going and figure out how what you're going to do to activate. So then, um, and I'm wrapping up here. Uh, this is also from Gwen Dwyer. She says, there must remain some infinitesimal possibility that the climate skeptics are right and everybody else is wrong. But the evidence for global warming caused by human activities is so strong and so urgent, actions are required. The potential cost of doing too little too late is vastly greater than the cost that might be incurred by doing more to fight global warming than it turns out to be at some later date to have been strictly necessary. And I totally agree with her. So um, my, this is kind of my, uh, my hit list for what I would really like to get done here. This is the uh, to-do list. We need to continue, and I'm addressing IFLA here, we need to continue to join our respective professional organizations so to activate all of our constituencies so we can be more powerful and persuasive politically. We need to advocate for funding for a Manhattan type of project to advance research on geoengineering, either lobby for funding from the government or better yet, push for organizations of, an, of international groups that are funded by the private sector. Make our voices louder and stronger so more people can hear us. Let's jump outside of our professional boundaries and become climate communicators. Let's mount a worldwide PR campaign that aligns us with climate change action. Let's connect our organizations to enable a web of knowledge. Let's continue to work at all scales, but mitigation must be brought into the conversation and actually to the forefront. And then lastly, please, let's us all together as individuals and foundations support the world's forests, because we all need to pitch in to help those organizations who are fight, uh, fighting to protect them. All right, so I think um, that's it. Oh, one last thing to uh, uh, academics out there. Good, all right, this is for you and for me. Yeah. We have to make a change to our curriculum. So teaching climate change, including mitigation, is mandatory. All landscape architects should be fluent in the language and science of climate change. And we need to re retrofit our curriculum so our profession is equipped with enough, enough knowledge to teach clients, planners, decision makers about the issues their cities and communities will be facing in the future and what landscape can do to help them face it. I've already taken a shot bar at ASLA. Um, I sent them kind of what they should be doing. And I thought, like, I think I got a well, thank you, Martha, for uh, 
Um, we'll get around to it in 2020, like some of the sense now. Um, I did put this up here. Um, here's your reading list. Um, if you want the reading list, you can always come to me and say, gee, that reading list, list looks really great. I want to read it, and I can always email it to you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry I took up so much of your time.